Hey everybody! Welcome back to the online place of Binding of Isaac Adric Plus. It's we're on six wins, it's easy. Easy like an Eden streak. I was kinda you know, I don't mind a Judas run. It's spicy, but I don't mind. I was kinda hoping for Kane though, it's been a while. EYSO, EY, EY, SO CP1H. Okay, boomer. Hey! Nelly references are not merely restricted to those of boomer age. Zoomers like Nelly as well. Uh, probably. Um, so anyway, I'm a little spooked now. Number one is awesome in, in so many ways. But also is uh, a little spiced. You know? Like we... We have to get closer to enemies, which is very dangerous when a single champion could kill you. The more dangerous thing is honestly like those rooms where you have to shoot a bomb uh, or like a TNT barrel in order to get out. Those have got me um, sweating a little bit. So champions be gone. TNT barrels be gone. Uh, spirit hearts please show up on the other hand. I desire them, and when we got them, I would respire them as well. That's right, I would breathe. I would breathe those spirit arts in. I would vaporize them in a, a now illicit flavor pod and consume them. Look, I clearly have no idea how vaping works, okay? I... I, I don't want to... I, I recognize I got a lot of vape lords that watch these videos and, you know, my personal philosophy on a lot of things is basically live and let live. You know, if you're... I don't really care if you vape or if you don't vape. What I do care is, like, when was the last time you called your mom? You know, you should be... You should be nicer to your parents. You, I, I mean, I don't know how they raised you. Maybe they raised you in a bad way, but you know what I mean. If all other things are equal, you should call your mom. Less time vaping, more more time calling your mom. But I will say, I have uh, attracted the ire of some vape-friendly individuals for complaining about vape. Um, the reason I've complained about vape is because I've been in public and just been uh, having an assault on the senses walking by. Um, I'm just going to be honest, mostly dudes, maybe like 100% dudes who emit an enormous cloud of chocolate cake smelling gas from their, uh, let's try this, from their uh, respiratory system and, you know, blow a huge cloud up into the sky. So I'm not anti-vape. What I am is anti-butthole. Why does butthole sound so anatomical when a-hole doesn't? I'm anti-jerk, okay? That's my philosophy on that subject. I'm not trying to take down the vaping industry. I'm just trying to... Con I'm trying to shame people into doing it more discreetly in public. Or at least, you know... Cause you don't have to blow the clouds that big. Anyway, what I was gonna say... You, you might be saying, NL, you're coming in off the top a little aggressive in today's episode. It's true. You know why? Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games comes out in a couple of hours. And yet there's no reviews for it. How is such a thing even possible? Oftentimes, that is, for if those of you who are in the know, in the media industry, if a video game does not have an embargo that is well in advance of its street release date, oftentimes that can be taken as a bellwether that the game might be kind of bad. Same with movies, right? Whenever you see a movie that is like, it didn't screen for critics. That movie is trying to sneak in. It's, tr it's, it's relying on your naivete, being like, well, maybe they didn't screen it for critics because they were worried about spoilers. Yeah, well, I mean, they screened Avengers Endgame for critics. So, you know, what's the new uh, uh, David Spade movie worried about? Either way. Maybe we shouldn't have picked that up. Did not matter. This is a great setup, and I'm feeling pretty sweet right now. Actually meant to keep exploring a little bit, but oh well. Um, but in this case, it's kind of weird because I have uh, 
you know, believe it or not, I got friends in the press. <laughs> That's not a threat, by the way. Um, and I, everything I've heard from people playing the game is that it's like surprise. It's weird, but like surprisingly, you know, better than you would expect from an Olympics game. And I already uh, like Olympics games for some reason that I can't even fathom. So I'm like, dude, where's where's the reviews? For Sonic and Mario, with the, I'm gonna buy it no matter what, so I don't know what I care, but it's like, you know, being a kid when you're like, uh, you know, it's not even that I want to know whether it's good or bad, I just want to read more about it right now. <laughs> and I, you know, in particular, I want to see how the freaking online looks. Just to see if it's gonna be appropriate for the NLSS before we decide whether or not we're gonna, you know, pick up like six copies of it for people involved in the show. Um... I got a I got a soft spot for mini game collections, which is basically what every um, Olympic video game is, and I have a, a soft spot for uh, sports video games. Olympics video game like mini game collections tend to be the worst of both worlds. They tend to be worse, like way less in depth than your average AAA sports game, um, but also like way more uh, restrictive than your average mini game collection. You know, because, like, at the end of the day, it might be, you know, 25 sports in an Olympics video game. But then, like, you know, you look at London 2012, there's, like, you know, men's and women's archery. Men's and women's 100-meter dash. And then, you know, 100-meter, 200-meter, and 400-meter dash are functionally the exact same. You get the idea. You know, there's a lot of repetition is what I'm trying to say. But, you know, you, and I know I'm not doing a good job of selling the game. I don't have to sell the game. I have to buy the game. There's two different stories. For whatever reason, I, I still, uh, I cannot deny the fact that Olympics video games have a certain pull over me. An almost so bad it's goodness that cannot be denied now nor in 1994 when the Lillehammer Olympics were taking place. It's the honest to goodness truth. I remember going to Blockbuster Video. Renting um, Lillehammer, 1994. I rented Nagano, 1998. Um, and to this day, it's the best representation of curling I've ever seen in a video game. I don't know why more video games don't approach curling. Many video games approach bowling. Many video games approach golf. Curling, non-existent for whatever reason. We gotta wait for Disney Tsum Tsum Party or whatever it's called. Fine, I could use the HP, honestly. We'll be leaving. To be honest with you, I don't believe I ever played Salt Lake City 2002. Don't believe I ever played Turin 20, 2006. <laughs> there we go. I didn't play Vancouver 2010 either, but... Uh, TELUS World of Science has a ski setup where you can play the skiing game involved in that game. And then it gives you a lecture about, like, skiers use this many muscles to turn. So I have experienced it at the very least. Um, but London 2012, absolutely. Unfortunately, we're in, like, the... we're in a dry spell. Apparently, on an economic level, the games don't really, uh, do that well. So they haven't been making them as much anymore. You see what you've done, reviewers, by giving your honest opinion on bad games? You made them release less. Very slightly... Help. Inhibiting my quality of life once every two to four years, depending on how much I care about the Summer Olympics. Anyway. I don't know, dude. Sports video games. You know why I like a sport video game? You don't always have to watch the tutorial. You know, it's like, skiing! You're like, okay, I get it. Use the left stick to move, get to the mountain, the bottom of the mountain as fast as possible, pass through the gates. Sometimes you boot up like a Mario Party or a, you know, Pummel Party or something like that. And you're like, um, you know, it's a wiffle ball wackiness. Use the, by rotating the right stick at one radian per second, you charge up your wiffle ball. If you throw your wiffle ball at the sniffle, the best and closest wiffle ball to the sniffle hole gets one Peter point. 
If you get five Peter points, you can choose to cash that in for a bomb that can immolate your enemies or alternatively be used to open a loot box to determine whether or not you can get even more Peter points or a grand prize, a super bomb that instantly wins you the game. And then, you know, I may be being a little bit exaggeratory. You get, you get the idea. I like it when it's like, mash the A button and throw the ball far. That's my speed, dude. Don't make me think. It's a classic design book. I don't really want that. What I do want to do is go to the item room. This feels like a second secret room waiting to happen. I'm kind of surprised. Like, the run is great. Um, but we could definitely... Hey, hey, hey now. What? <laughs> That's okay. If you give me money or Steam sale... I'm laughing because we can go to the shop regardless. Get something useful. Whatever, dude, you got me. Congratulations. I played myself. Not too worried about our red hearts, thanks to the little chat here, but. What? <laughs> pa uh, pardon me, sir. Um, I don't mean to be a bother, but I just fought you, and as a result, uh, I don't believe that you should exist on this planet. It's been a good day, though. It was a good NLSS. Played a lot of Unrailed on it, admittedly. Unrailed, great game. I, I love those... Uh, any game... is It's actually one of my favorite genres of co-op game. And there are other games that fit. And I'm going to get to them. I'm, I'm just setting the stage for the bit here. I love any game that forces communication. Is the reason I love Unrailed. It's the reason I love uh, Overcooked. You know, any game where one person reasonably cannot carry everybody else just by virtue of their own talent, and you absolutely have to work together. Because, to be honest with you, communication is kind of... It's my strong suit in life, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, most of the time, I don't get uh, a chance to use it in video games to, to accomplish much. You know what I mean? Like, the best that happens is, like, in PUBG... They'll be like, Ryan, where was the guy that shot you? And I'll be like, 35 degrees, slightly over the ridge. He's kneeling on the left side of a rock. People are like, great call out. But could you just learn how to shoot, please? So many key requirements here. Ooh, that's pretty good. But, you know, a game where I thought I really excelled was another game that I would put in this genre, which is uh, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. That's a game where you say what you mean, mean what you say, and you could accomplish your goals. Instead of being like, there's a button in front of me. You gotta be like, I see a green button that says don't push on it, and it has an octagonal etching around the outside. Then they go, okay, octagonal etching. If it has an octagonal etching, press the button three times, wait for the red light to turn green, and then flip the bomb over three times, you know? Those are those are my kind of games. And you know, there are real-world equivalents. Uh, escape rooms, I think, are a great example. They reward multiple types of skills. You know, if you're uh, good at puzzles, you know, like logic puzzles, brain teasers, you're probably going to be pretty decent in some ways in an escape room. Um, if you are... Uh, you know, good at arithmetic, you know, basic arithmetic, logic, etc., etc. Um, you're going to be good at escape rooms in some of the puzzles, at least. But the number one skill I think that helps you out in an escape room is not losing your freaking cool and being able to work with other people, you know? So that's my role in the escape room, is to very politely tell people, like, no, I'm pretty sure, John, they didn't mean for us to just pull on the lock until it broke, okay? And then I, you know, I got a slight arithmetic acumen as well, but... I like games like that. There's not that many, and I understand why. You need kind of a unique use case for it. Um, and also, in a lot of situations, and, you know, don't shoot the messenger here. Um, a lot of people are not good at those kinds of games, because they're unable to actually take feedback. Don't, don't shoot the messenger! I've played Overcooked with people, and this is not Kate, I'm talking to when we did it on the NLSS once. 
not everybody is capable of accepting orders. And I know that sounds like a, a very high and mighty way to be, oh, everyone has to listen to you. Nah, dude. I love to, in Unrailed, Josh drives the bus. He's the conductor. Josh tells me to go north. I might say, are you sure? If he says yes, we're going north, you know? There's got to be not just a chain of command, but like communication in those games. I, I don't mind being told what to do, to be honest. But if you're going to play Overcooked with somebody and you're like, you know, maybe you don't have time for politeness, you know? You're like, hey, make that radish now. People can be, sometimes they take offense that, oh, I'll make the radish. Why don't you make the radish? Well, I don't have time to explain this right now. But the reason I can't make the radish is I'm washing the dishes so that when the radish is done... There is a clean plate for it to go on so we can serve it and not disrupt our combo and lose our chance at getting a three-star score, okay? Sometimes you just gotta... Oh, it's a double-tinted. You just gotta listen and, and do it. I, those games, they have respect for, for people of action, of which I consider myself one sometimes when it serves me. Anyway. A lot of people, apparently, I have, I've only recently realized this, a lot of people do not play video games um, in order to simulate a workplace environment. They already have a workplace environment that they go home to simulate uh, tranquility that does not exist in their occupational life. I can, cannot relate to that. I spend most of my days by myself, having the opportunity to get into some sticky situations with the boys. I relish it. And can you add the ketchup and mustard, please? And then that burger's good to go. Anyway, I'm assuming Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games would not be like that. <laughs> Probably unlikely to be like, okay, now Knuckles, rotate the stick counterclockwise to tie Sonic's shoelaces so he can beat Dr. Eggman in the 100 meter dash. I'm feeling pretty good about this run. We've got some great items. Succubus plus high damage is doing great work for us. I do sort of feel like for the opportunities we've had, we're a little underpowered. But there's still a good deal with the devil chance here. There's still a, a, a shop that should be pretty solid for us coming up. Um, I think we should, We have to... Like, the reason I'm kind of... You know, you can say it if you want. The reason I'm sort of rushing here is HP is at a bit of a premium, and probably, you know, going to other rooms isn't that dangerous, but I would rather, like, try to go to the shop and hope it has a reroll machine, buy useful items and, you know, multiple spirit hearts, both of which seem to be potentially on the menu here, and, uh, you know, s tackle it from there. And we'll see where the, where the mood strikes us. There is no reroll machine. Two of hearts is functionally worthless. We will buy many items. We will even buy a bomb, which is a rarity at this stage of the game. And then I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to... We have skirted around some exploration here. So I wanted to peep. Second secret room. In case there was an eternal heart, there is no eternal heart. Okay. Well, I think we're just going to... I think we're just going to be here. We're just going to live in the moment. Stay frosty. Because he got slowed by nightlight, my own timing got messed up. <laughs> that hurts, dude. I had a weird moment today. So, um, you know, we've been having a bunch of stuff delivered to the house. You know, furniture, light fixtures, etc. Today, an electrician was installing the light fixtures. And, uh, you know, Kate was like, you should look at it. So I went and I looked at it, and I said what I'm supposed to say, which is it looks nice. And it does look nice, but, like, what do I know about light fixtures, right? You're like, NL, you gotta relax sometimes. Well, can I... I'm... I'm... I, I'm beholden to the rules of logic and reason, even when it doesn't work well for me, you know? Hey, honey, how does this light fixture look? Uh... Twere in my station to critique light fixtures. I would say it is a good light fixture, but as I do not know anything about light fixtures, my opinion, does it mean more than the opinion of a rube? 
or of the rat on the street that scurries to and fro? Searching only for warmth, as I such would be searching for warmth by giving you the answer you clear. Just say it looks good. Why are you why are you like this? Anyway. So the electrician was installing the fixture, you know, over our bed. And um I said it, it was hanging a little low, okay? And I said, Good thing we're not that tall. And then he turned around and went, excuse me. Like, could you, what did you say? He didn't say it in a bad way. Then I was like, it's a good thing we're not that tall. And then he just sort of went like, uh. And then, like, started doing his work again. And I realized, I think that the man may have thought that I was insulting his height. And I do understand how that misinterpretation could come to pass. But simultaneously, dude... If that's the case, I do not apologize in this rare situation. Because you should know contextually, once you're out of that bedroom, that's the last time you're gonna be there. <laughs> it doesn't matter how tall you are, as long as you're, you know, tall enough to install it comfortably. And not so tall that you can't install it comfortably. What, you really think that you would come into my house and install something? And then, uh, I would just be like, hey, great work installing the light short stuff. I would never do that. Plus, he seemed like he was my height, but, you know, I am at, so I'm like 5'10". Um, I'm at a weird height where people never know whether I'm tall or short. Only, only other 5'10 people will understand what I'm saying. But sometimes I'll talk to people I've known for a long time, and they'll be like, yeah, but you're tall. And I'm like, I'm not really tall. I'm like... Average, maybe even slightly below average height. They're like, nah, dude, you're tall. Why would I lie about that? But then I talk to, you know, some other dudes who are 5'10", and they're like, man, I wish I was, like, 6'1". So I don't know. Some some people at 5'10", are content with their height. That definitely describes me. Um, some people at 5'10", are very self-conscious about their height for whatever reason. It's a bagel boss sort of thing. I'm not saying this guy was there. You're not God, or my father, or my boss. I don't know, height's always a weird one. I'm here to tell you, look. I have no idea, um, you know, on an objective, physical attractiveness level where I'm at. And it honestly has never really concerned me that much, but it does surprise me. It, it, it makes me a little sad, you know, to know that there's young men out there who, you know, and obviously, like, it happens to young women as well, but, I mean, more, probably, at least historically, but, um, that there are men out there who are so preoccupied, um, you know, with something like their height, they feel like their height specifically is holding them back when it comes to making romantic partners. Look! There are some people out there on planet Earth, um, this is my take on the subject at least, that you probably will not be able to, to have a relationship with if they are very height focused or hair focused, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's just, you know, you, you can be upset about it, but it just sort of is what it is. But I'm here to tell you, most people are probably going to be way more weirded out by the fact that you're clearly weirded out by your height than they actually will be by your height. That's that's my take on the subject. And I know, oh, NL, you don't get it. You uh, uh, you don't understand something. So anyway, I kind of, I feel like I do. You know, what percentage of, of men go completely bald in their teenage years, it's got to be like, if I had to guess, I would say that it's under 2%, but probably more. Probably less, I mean to say, like maybe under 1%. Like, I don't know, you know, like I went to a large Canadian undergraduate university. I don't know if there was another bald undergrad that was not like a 50 year old person coming back 
after having like a career, you know? So you would, you know, that's the kind of thing. When you, when you think of like the preferences of the average 19 year old woman, you know? They're like five years out from being like, I wanna marry Prince William. Which the irony, of course, being that he's as bald as I am now, but anyway. You know, you're 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 dealing with you, you could rationalize that as being like a catastrophic situation. And it turns out it's totally fine. It I mean, you know, did it did it limit uh people that maybe I could have been in a relationship or romantically involved with? I'll I'll never know. But you know what limits the amount of uh your your pool for being in a romantic relationship? being concerned every single conversation that you're like oh my god i bet she's looking at my hair uh, you know you're you, instead of being known as oh yeah he's bald but whatever he's a good guy you get known as the weirdo who's constantly concerned about the way that his hair appears in this light you know you got to get over it that's all i'm saying there's nothing else to do but get over it yo these are four pretty good items and I think, you know, most of the most of the young men posting online about how, you know, they'll never find a partner because their jaw isn't quite masculine enough, you know, they will probably get over it as well. Look, I'm here to tell you, as I've seen some uggos in my life that have become very happy with their partners, okay? <laughs> If the guy who went bald at 19 can figure it out, you can figure it out too, is all I'm trying to say. I don't know what I'm talking about for the most part. I don't know, maybe it's different now. Maybe it's slightly different now. I mean, I'm not 100 years old. But I don't know what the apps and the and the tinders and the grinders and the, and the gapers and whatever the heck all the apps are called. Maybe it's, maybe it's changed the game. I don't really care, to be honest. Why are you talking about it? Because once you start talking, it's hard to... There's a little thing I like to call conversational iner conversation inertia. It's what gets people into trouble, you know? When you start... You, you, you leave an open space in the conversation, people feel compelled to fill it. So if somebody starts, you know, saying something weird, you just go, oh, really? And then just kind of let it sit there, and they'll be like, yeah, well, you know, I do dress up rats as my favorite... European generals, but like, you know, they'll, they'll talk about it ad nauseum, and then later they'll be like, why did I say so much? So stupid. <laughs> like a bag of sand? Anyway. Also, it's my job. Why are you talking? This is your job. This run ended up being very good. It, you gotta admit, the number one pickup right off the bat, we didn't have a choice. It was either question mark or nothing. Um, and to be honest with you, sometimes nothing is probably the right selection there. It was a little spiced early with that number one pickup, but, you know, Succubus came in. Gave us a very, uh, very, very easy path to victory once we got our HP sorted out and... You know, now we got nothing to worry about. Decent trinket tier synergy. Very few complaints about where we're at right now. For now, it was a good run. And thanks for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed the episode. If you did, click the like button. I hope that a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching. I will. We'll see you next time. See ya!